Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, dear guests, young people. Um, we are privileged, and I think every one of you uh, made an effort to come this morning to church. It is a beautiful Sabbath morning. As I was driving, um, you can see the fog a little bit, and then you can see it's going to be a wonderful, sunny, uh, maybe mixed with clouds, but beautiful day, which, um, which I, I think brings sunshine uh, in our lives as well. So today we are going to, um, we are going to look at this topic, uh, which was already announced, Steps to Christ. Anyone can help me? Do you know of a book with the same name? Yeah. There is a book, right? Yeah. Written by Sister White, Steps to Christ. Yeah. And um, before we discuss and meditate upon this topic, I'd like to take you to um, several... And many times we can see when he wanted to communicate something to them, he would not speak directly, but he would speak to them in parables. He would give them illustrations. If he would be in nature, he would say, and the sower went to sow the seed. If he was by the seaside, he would say, well, and they went to catch fish. So he would give always parables from nature, from, um, from society, from their culture, and, um, and many other uh, things that they would encounter almost daily. So at this time we will look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. I hope you brought your Bibles. So this is Luke, chapter 5. And we will read from verse 36. Some of his parables were more lengthy. Some of them were very short. And the ones I'm going to read today, they are among the short ones. But this doesn't mean that they were not significant. This doesn't mean they, that they are not meaningful and that, that they do not have an application. All of his parables had an application, and every word that Christ spoke, it was not for the sake of time. Who? A publican. So he called him to become one of his disciples. And some of the Pharisees and, and Sadducees, they were questioning the qualities and the society he was calling his disciples. And then he gave them these parables because they were saying, well, couldn't he find, you know, something better in Judea? Couldn't he go to some of the scholars? Couldn't he go to some of the people who went to the schools of the prophets, to some people that studied law and studied Torah? H how come that he goes to these people of a lower grade in society? Some of them were considered as outcasts. And Christ gives them these parables. Now watch this. This is Luke 5, 36. And he spoke also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old, if otherwise than both the new maketh a rent. And the piece that was taken out of the new agreeth not with the old. 
So in our society, if you are um, in good reason, and if you know what you're doing, if you got a rent on your ga garment, on your coat, or on your jacket, Sorry about that. So if you got this, this rent or this issue with the garment, nobody buys a new one to do what? To, to fix the old one, right? You would do what? You, you would find a, 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 a used one and you would fix. And, and this is what Christ is saying here. So th this is the first parable. The second one, you see, you see, one parable in, um, uh, is just one Bible verse. And verse 37, And no man put the new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. So here he talks about old wine and new wine, old bottles and new bottles. He talks about the wine skins. And I'd like to give you some background what he was talking about, because probably for many of us, we would not understand living in the 21st century what it means, wine skins. So, a wine skins means uh, usually would be a goat. They would take the skin of the goat and put it on the other side. It was, it was treated first of all. And where it was the neck, they would make that spout and they would, um, uh, they would prepare it carefully. And then the new wine, the fresh grape juice, they would put into this wine bottles were wine skins they were called so when it was new these skins they would stretch because you know what happens in the hot summer in palestine you know if you keep the wine uh, the, the ju grape juice outside of the fridge it will go what in a few days it will ferment it will turn into alcohol it will turn into wine So, so they would, this was the way how they would preserve, uh, how they would, would keep the wine, in these wine skins. So imagine this, if you have a new harvest, you got new grapes, and you made new grape juice, and then the, the Christ says, no one who is in good mind will take the old wine skins, or the old bottles, because they didn't have the plastic bottles in the first century. So that's how they would preserve. So nobody, he says, will take the old ones and would put the new wine in the old ones. Otherwise, we'll do what? It will burst. It will burst. So he says, but new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. And the last text here, it says, verse 39, No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, The world is better. I, um, I'd like to give some, um, some explanation briefly what he was meaning by telling them these parables. So, what was behind, what was he going to communicate to them? I'd like, first of all, to read from uh, uh, Bible Commentary, vol Volume 5, page 1088. <clears throat> the work of Jesus was to reveal the character of the Father and to unfold the truth which he himself had spoken through prophets and apostles. But there was found no place for the truth in those wise and prudent men. Christ 
the way, the truth, and the life had to pass by the self-righteous Pharisees and take his disciples from unlearned fishers and men of humble rank. These who had never been to their rabbis, who had never sat in the schools of the prophets, who had not been members of the Sanhedrin, whose hearts were not bound about with their own ideas, these he took and educated for his own use. He could make them as new bottles for the new wine of his kingdom. These were the babies to whom the Father could reveal spiritual things, but the priests and rulers, the scribes and Pharisees, who claimed to be the depositaries experience he says they are like bottles but they are the old bottles and Jesus when he came he brought the new wine the new grape juice you know in Revelation 17 it talks about the harlot and what the Bible says about the harlot that every king and every damnitary was drinking from the wine which was in her cup. And the wine in the Bible means what? Teachings and doctrines and knowledge. So when Christ came and he says, look, I came and I am the new wine. If I try to put in these old bottles, they will not accept. They are not prepared to understand because they are too educated in their own way. They are too indoctrinated. So he says, I had to turn from the scribes and Pharisees and from the elite, from Sanhedrin, and to go where? To go to those fishermen, to go to the publicans, to go to those harlots and preach to them. And these were the new wineskins. These were the new wine bottles. Bible Commentary 1089, Jesus knew that he, that he could do the scribes and Pharisees no good unless they would empty themselves of self-importance. He chose new bottles for his new wine of doctrine and made fishermen and unlearned believers the heralds of his truth to the world. And yet, though his doctrine seemed new to the people, it was in fact not a new doctrine, but the revelation of the significance of that which had been taught from the beginning. It was his design that his disciples should take the plain, unadulterated truth for the guide of their life. So, brethren, this is the meaning of the parables. Now, I'd like you to pay attention to one moment here in verse 39. And be, just, just pay attention when we read it once again. So it's Luke 5, 39. And he says, No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, The world is better. What he says? The world is better. Uh, this is King James. I'd like to give you one more translation, and I'm re reading from New King James, the same text. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says, 
the world is better. So what's, what's the word here? Straightway or immediately. No one straightway says, well, I think this is much better. I think the old one is not good. Actually, nowadays, you know how people qualify and they, um, and they uh, the, the wine, older the wine, they say, well, it's better. In this context, what he means, he says, no one who drank from the old one would turn and say, well, I've got this kind of funny or whatever you may consider. But let's say that some of you would go, and you can find it in every city, in every town, you know, people that are uh, possessed, I would say, by alcohol. They, they are controlled by this vice. So nobody would, l- let's say one of you goes and says, hey, would bring a, a, a bottle of grape juice. We make our own. Last year we went to... Uh, this place, it's as you go towards Niagara, and we bought these amazing grapes. It's called Cabernet, you know, French uh, grapes, and we made our own grape juice at home. Not diluted, fresh grape juice. It's amazing. So if you if you go to one of those people and you say, "Hey, look here, he is drunk. He is he is out." <laughs> so you go and say, "Look, try this one." And he would still be not sure. He would say, oh, do you think he would like? No. No. No way. No way. He says, oh, where, 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 where did you keep it before that? No, he would say, no, this is not what I'm looking for. And, and that's what Christ says. No one who drank the old one straightway will look for the new one. This is impossible. It's not immediately. And now I'd like to read a few verses from, um, <clears throat> one of them is our key verse, it's Second Corinthians 3.18. So we are in uh, Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as <clears throat> in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> Brethren, let me ask you, if you paid attention to the Scripture, how are we going to be changed? From glory to glory. This is just one verse. Now, I'd like to read one more. This is Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So if, if, you, if you read carefully, what is Apostle Paul saying in both of these quotations? In, in, in 2 Corinthians, he was saying from glory to glory. Now he's saying what? From faith to faith. And, and brethren, remember this. Our topic today is what? Is it jumping to Christ? Steps to Christ. Do you realize it? It's steps to Christ. It's not jumping. It's not limping. It's steps to Christ. And one more. This is um, 2 Corinthians 4.16. For which cause we faint not, but for our outward man perish, and the inward man is renewed. How? Day by day. There are many people out there who teach that once you are saved, always saved. That's false. You can't find it in the Bible. Apostle Paul is, has just destroyed this doctrine. You know, you just read a few verses and you can see this is not true. He says, step by step, day by day, from faith to faith. You're going to grow daily. 
You're going to fight daily. You're going to struggle daily. Let's read one, uh, one paragraph from the book Steps to Christ. Page 69. <clears throat> Many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin, but now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. But every such effort must fail. Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness all depend upon our union with Christ. It is by communion with Him daily, hourly, by abiding in Him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. And pay attention to the sentence I highlighted. He is to be with us not only at the beginning and the end of our course, but at every step of the way. David says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Remember one thing? Steps to Christ. Here we, uh, we will, would like to talk a little bit about sanctification. I know for some of you and for younger ones, this might sound, you know, justification, sanctification. But I believe that you will understand. We will put it in such a way that even a child can come to a degree of understanding what, what Christ has to say here. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, 1 Thessalonians 4.3, we read, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. What is the will of God? Our sanctification. Councils for the church, one paragraph, page 56. There is no such thing as instantaneous sanctification. True sanctification is a daily work, continuing as long as life shall last. Those who are battling with daily temptations, overcoming their own sinful tendencies, and seeking for holiness of heart and life, make no boastful claims of holiness. They are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Sin appears to them exceedingly sinful. So what do you think? According to what this paragraph in the Bible says, can we just w w w all of a sudden just become saints? Don't be afraid to say that. No. It says daily. It's a work of a lifetime, says Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 193. Let us be growing Christians. We are not to stand still. <clears throat> we are to be in advance today of what we were yesterday. Every day learning to be more trustful, more fully relying upon Jesus. Thus we are to grow up. You do not at once bound reach perfection. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Again, the same the same. Sentence almost. Sanctification, and in simple words, sanctification means to be set aside from sin. So this is not complicated. To sanctify, you remember what the Bible says in the beginning? God, after creating everything and the humankind, God said, and he rested on the seventh day. He blessed the seventh day, and he did one more thing. What did he do? He sanctified it. Sanctifying means putting aside. Sanctifying means he left like a window in time. And he said, this is not your time. This is my time. This is not your day. This is my day. It's not you or any human being to decide which day. I have decided it's the seventh day, the 
Sabbath. And then later on, God says, the 10th percent of your income, it's not yours. And, and, and it says in, in Torah that he sanctified the tithe. So you see, things which are sanctified, they, they are put aside. When the Bible says that God's desire is your sanctification, God wants what? To sanctify us, to separate us from sin. And this is a slow process. You can't say, brethren, well, I woke up this morning and I am a saint. I'm holy. This is not biblical. Are you with me? Selected messages 204. Excitement is not sanctification. Entire conformity to the will of our Father which is in heaven is, do, is alone sanctification. And the will of God is expressed in His holy law. The keeping of, the, of all the commandments of God is sanctification. Can we keep the commandments of God on our own? No. So that's why it's a cooperation in between the human and the divine, in between man and Christ. Proving yourselves obedient children to God's word is sanctification. The word of God is to be our guide, not the opinions or ideas of man. <clears throat> and the last part in this study. I'd like to talk about struggling. Many times we meet people, and um, I know many people, you, you, you just meet them, and, um, and um, you ask, how are you, brother or my friend? And people, what, what people say usually? Uh, you know what? I'm struggling. D did you meet somebody who says, I'm struggling, brother. I'm struggling, sister. And it's not just for adults. Everyone is struggling, I hope. Now, many times we think, well, this is so bad. You know, well, brother, if you're struggling, poor man, poor woman. You know, poor boy, if you're struggling, something is wrong. Well, let, let me tell you something. If you are struggling, and I hope you are, this is good news. This is good news. This is not bad news. Brethren, if you do not have any struggles, it means you are walking with the enemy of God. I know this might sound strong words, but this is the truth. If you do not struggle, something is wrong. Now, in, um, in the book of Proverbs 24, verse 16, this is Proverbs 24, verse 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. How many times the just man will fall? Seven times. So now tell me, when somebody falls down, and probably most of us, we fell sometime in the past, when we are children, or even now, you, you have slipped on the ice, or you, know, you, you just didn't watch a step, and you fell. So when you fell, it means, when you are, when you are down, it means that you are not up, correct? So in order to be up, it means that you first were down. You understand? So, so the, this is the idea. Solomon says that the righteous one, the just one, will fall seven times, but he will get up. The, the good news is that the just will keep getting up and getting up and getting up. So I, I'm not going to ask you. I, I know probably you, you have your own struggles. And you know them. You don't need to make them public. I'll just share one of them that I had or still have, maybe. And how God can liberate us. Many years ago, when I was younger, I'm still young, hopefully. <laughs> so... 
I used to like a lot of ice cream. No, I'm not picking just on... This is a simple one. So I was living by myself, big city. I could eat as much as I want. And actually, at one point in my life, <clears throat> the work I was doing, of course, not preaching the gospel, some kind of business work, I was eating like few of them per day, you know. And I know my parents would not agree, and my father would give me an advice, but I was far from home anyway. So I came to a point after reading certain materials, you know, and uh, some books of uh, spirit prophecy, you know, and I understood two things. And I still understand. The thing that I am doing doesn't mean that is right. So I understood two things. It says, well, ice cream, first of all, it's a combination of two bad. Those two ingredients combined, they can harm you. So it's a combination of milk and sugar. So milk and sugar will create in your stomach um, um, fermentation. So I'm not trying now to convince anyone, or I'm just giving an example. Number two, because it's so cold, it's not good, first of all, for the teeth, and secondly, for stomach. So two things, cold and bad combination. So I said, Lord, please help me. I want, I want to, to stay away. And believe it or not, I asked God, and for about two years, I didn't touch any. So see, certain things in your life, if you ask God, says, Lord, I'm struggling with this and that. And the Lord will help you, liberates you. Somebody is str struggling with drinking. Somebody is struggling with smoking. Somebody is struggling with um, uh, some other things. So, di different habits. And, and we, know what is, we, we know what is our struggle. I wish every struggle we had would be so simple. But unfortunately, many times we, we say, Lord, this would be the last time. And we find ourselves doing it again and again. Steps to Christ, page 70. A life in Christ is a life of restfulness. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there should be an abiding, peaceful trust. Your hope is not in yourself, it is in Christ. Your weakness is united to his strength, your ignorance to his wisdom, your frailty to his enduring might, so you are not to look to yourself, not to let the mind dwell upon self, but look to Christ. Let the mind dwell upon his love upon the beauty, the perfection of his character. If you ask me, brother, how can I succeed? How can I overcome this struggle, this temptation? This would be the recipe, brethren. To meditate, to think about, to dwell upon the beauty and perfection of his character. And notice the next sentence. Christ in his self-denial, Christ in his humiliation, Christ in his purity and holiness, Christ in his matchless love. This is the subject for the soul's contemplation. It is by loving him, copying him, depending wholly upon him, that you are, be to, tr that you are to be transformed into his likeness. This is the beauty of the gospel. Solomon says, the just man will fall seven times, but he will get up. And remember one thing, it steps to Christ. I can give you a couple examples. Uh, do you remember Peter? Once he, w he wanted to walk because his master was walking on, on the water. And he said, Lord, command me, tell me to come to you. And he said, come. And he made few steps. You know that, right? He was walking to Christ. And what happened? He was not walking towards Satan. He was walking to Christ. And what happened? When he looked back, he started drowning. But he was walking. 
But that was not the finito. He said, Lord, please help me. Remember again, the just man will fall seven times, but he will get up. He will fall and he will get up. He will fall and he will get up until one moment that God will say, you have overcome it. And the last paragraph I'd like to read is also Steps to Christ. Amazing book. I would recommend to everyone, if there is anyone in this room today, if there is anyone watching this live stream, please get this book. It's a little brochure. And study it. Read it with prayer. And you will see the beauty of the message of salvation. You will see the beauty and you will fall in love with someone that truly loves you. Steps to Christ, page 64. There are those who have, not, who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God, yet they realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty, and they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, dear guests, and young people, is there any one of you today that reading or listening to this paragraph, you could say the same? Yes, I am the one that have come to the knowledge. I have one that have tasted from this fruit. I am the one that have tasted the message of the gospel. And when you failed it, you say, Probably that was the wrong experience. Probably this is experience was not with the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably this was a failure. If you have or had this idea. Now watch what inspiration says. To such, I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes, but we are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken and rejected of God. No, Christ is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Said the beloved, beloved John, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And do not forget the words of Christ. The Father himself loveth you. He desires to restore you to himself, to, his, to see his own purity and holiness reflected in you. And if you will but yield yourself to him, he that have begun a good work in you will carry it forward to the day of Jesus Christ. Pray more Fervently, believe more fully as we come to distrust our own power. Let us trust the power of our Redeemer, and we shall praise Him who is the health of our countenance. Who is the one that comes to you and says, Your past experience was a failure, was, 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 was a fake one? Your, your past experience was not a true one. Who is the one that comes? Satan. He comes to discourage. He comes to, to sow that seed of questioning and doubting and discouragement. But the word of inspiration says, do not listen to it. That was not fake. That was not artificial. That was a true experience. But remember one thing. We are not jumping, but we are what? We are walking steps to Christ. This is my message, brothers and sisters, today. So if we listen carefully, and I hope that each and every one of you will have this experience personally with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says here, He didn't give up on us. He didn't say, well, I am done with you. He is still waiting. And He wants us that we would understand the experience of salvation. It means steps to Christ. Amen.